four, last one being Palm Sunday in the series, uh, on forgiveness. And I'd like to begin simply with uh, an opening, an opening prayer. Great God, you are rich in mercy beyond our knowing. We thank you for the gift of your forgiveness of our sin made known to us in Jesus. Help us to open our minds and hearts to your Holy Spirit in the days ahead as we travel together through this Lenten season. Show us what we need to understand. Help us learn how to practice forgiveness in all our relationships so that we might experience the renewal of the common life, of the common life you desire and offer to us in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. So I have placed a number of things on your table, and I just want to say a word about the material. First of all, there's the book, and those books are up here if you ordered one, and you just uh, can affix the $10 to the clipboard there, and you come up and get your, uh, your book, Forgiveness of Lenten Study. Secondly, there should be a handout at every place, and uh, that handout is a two-sided uh, on one side, on one side is forgiveness the self forum, and on the other side are some prompts that we'll need later use for self examination. So then everybody will have, and they take with them, a journal, which is there, a little brown. Journal because part of the practices we will regularly engage in each forum is a little bit of journal. That's one of the spiritual practices, and you're supplied with a journal. Many of you brought your own pens. If so, use them, but there are some extra ones on the table if you need if you need those. So, first of all, if you'll look on the handout where it says forgiveness on the title page, I want to take you through a little bit the schedule for the five weeks so you know where we're headed and how we're going to get there. This whole venture has had a planning committee uh, of five people, uh, and you will see their names mentioned here. Uh, and of course, Pastor Martha was included on the retreat. I'm happy to see so many women here because I was afraid that there's going to be an opening a forum on men's forgiveness. Forgiving men. Kind of a fun there, forgiving men and forgiving men. Yeah, I like that. In any event, but that's not the okay. case. We have a, a nice uh, mixed group, which I'm very glad to. But very glad to see. So let me take you through that. Here we are. As I explained when I introduced the book at a couple of services, uh, it has six units. We only have five. So I'm going to smush together units one and two, uh, beginnings and self examination. And I put on this sheet, in case you have the book, in parentheses, uh, in bold face, uh, the parts of the book that will be drawn on in the fashion. So as you see, Sunday, February 25th, beginning with section one and self-examination section two, and I obviously am the moderator. Then the next unit is on honesty, which is unit three, and that will be led by uh, Dorothy Bass or a combination of the women who are on retreat because that's their talk. They're considering the topic of forgiveness on retreat, and we thought it might be best, in addition to covering the topic of honesty, to learn from them what kinds of conversations they had, what they've learned, what issues they still would like to lift up, and so we'll hear uh, that one moderated by Dorothy Bass. Next on Sunday, March 10th, comes Repentance, and you see there Bruce Pedersen uh, will be the presenter or the moderator. He's done a great deal of reading and reflection 
on the topic of repentance, and he will he will moderate that session. Then comes forgiving, which is really a kind of a way to get back into a review of where we've been and where we're headed in the last section. And I will uh, I'll be doing that one. And then finally, uh, Eric Movo, who's here, uh, and who's also a member of the planning committee with Bruce and me and, and Martha, will finish up uh, with the last topic, which is reconciliation, and he'll review, and he'll also introduce, he's done quite a lot of reading and thinking about the immense social science research that shows the effect physically that forgiveness has. Uh, on those who forgive, what forgiveness can do for your own body and psyche and emotional equilibrium and so forth. So we'll be sharing that, some review and the topic of reconciliation. That's our uh, that's our game plan. The reverse side of the sheet contains some prompts, which I'll mention later when we get to what we'll do in every period, which is to have some time to learn and reflect. Oh, really? So then for today, let me give you a roadmap of what I, what I hope to do. Um, I want to, first of all, just begin to reflect a bit on this immense topic of forgiveness and give you some sense of its complexity. What she does in the first chapter of beginnings is to begin to dip in a bit to the, the complexity of this immense uh, subject central to the Christian life, to be sure, but quite complicated. So I'll start a little bit about that. Uh, then I want to talk about this practice of self examination, which is her unit two. And uh, before that, I will refer to some scripture. Then you will have a period in which you will be invited, once I describe the process of self examination, to do some of that yourself. We'll give you some. 10 minutes or so to just sit quietly and engage in some self-examination along the lines of prompts. The prompts there are help to help you guide yourself in one of those two processes, either in self-examination of conscience or the self-examination of conscience. So pick one of those two and work your way through it. And then there'll be time for you to enter in your journal some reflections on what it was like to go through that process. Because as I said, this is not simply a matter of presentation and conversation. It's a matter of beginning to practice some spiritual disciplines that are appropriate to Christians all the time, but especially so during the during the Lenten season. And self examination is, is very much one of them. Any questions about any questions about that? Okay, I thought I'd read you a paragraph before entering into this complexity in which uh, the author here of the book, Marjorie Thompson, is talking about forgiveness, and here's what she says. There really is no Christianity without forgiveness. It is impossible to conceive any expression of Christian discipleship that ignores or excludes a virtue so central to the gospel. The entire message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection would be lost without it. Forgiveness is the healing stream flowing out from the crucified Christ over a world that does not know how desperately it needs the healing. Yet divine forgiveness, what Christ on the cross represents, is precisely what makes a realistic future possible within a human community still largely waiting around in the moment of emotional and spiritual immaturity. So that's a part of her introductory paragraph on the central importance of forgiveness for the, for the Christian life. Okay, just a few of the complexities before moving on to some reflection ourselves. I almost got a course on forgiveness. And the students in it were all Christians, so they varied widely in terms of denominational affiliation and, and, and theological literacy. And so I opened it simply by asking them what they thought forgiveness was. And they said, oh, it's, it's something you just offer uh, graciously to those who have offended you 
uh, and uh, it's primarily something you do in order to move on, in order not to get stuck in your own resentment. That I said, so let me let me just get this straight, class. So, as far as you're concerned, forgiveness is unilateral, one way. You offer it regardless of what the offender has done or failed to do, and it's for the benefit primarily, if not exclusively, for you, for the one doing the forgiving, not for him or her who's done the offense. Oh yes, they all agree, one hundred percent. Raise your hand. Well, this consensus lasted in my class about five minutes. <laughs> I said, "So, are we supposed to forgive because Jesus forgave us, and as Jesus forgives us, absolutely." So Jesus forgives us primarily for His sake. Oh uh, well, no, uh, he, he forgives us for our sake. But I thought you just said that forgiveness was primarily for the sake of the forgiver and we're to forgive as Jesus forgives. And how does this all well we're we're not we're not quite sure. And and, and forgiveness, you said, comes regardless of what the offender has done. The offender needs to do nothing. No repentance, no contrition, no, absolutely. Forgiveness should not depend on something someone else does. So when you went to church this Sunday, I said, the pastor came out, first thing the pastor said, I forgive you all your sins. Well, no, there's there's actually something before that. Well, what's that? Well, it's a prayer of repentance when we confess all of our sins and contrition when we say we're sorry for them, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, well, turn you, please. Things must be kind of mixed up because you just said forgiveness is something that just comes out of the blue. And never mind whether the offender repents, whether the offender is sorry for what he or she did, et cetera. Well, I guess we, we need to think further about that as well. Um, so I just touched on two of the issues here. There are legions of issues, which we'll get at during the coming weeks, but two of them is forgiveness transactional and transformational. That is, is it something that takes place between two or more people, even among two or more groups, transactional and transformational? Or is it unilateral and psychologically helpful? Something that persons do unilaterally, etc. And as we'll see, as I'm about to show you, it's never clear that there is one and only one type of forgiveness. Because many times, for example, we can't possibly have it be transactional. And we can't possibly have it be continued upon apology because many of us are still trying to forgive someone or many who have died. They can hardly now repent, and they might and they can hardly even notify that we have forgiven. So it's just obvious that depending on the context, it's going to be hard to lay down some some fast rule that apply to each and every case of forgiveness. And that's why we have Christian communities. Because it's there that we sort out together just exactly what this may entail for us as a group or for us individually in any given, in any given instance. Let me give you an example of one of several philosophers of forgiveness who tried to set up the ideal picture of forgiveness recognizing that you're never in the ideal situation. But ideally, forgiveness should require six things of the offender and six things of the one who is the offender. Here they are, the ideal one. So what the offender has to do, one, take responsibility for what he or she did by acknowledging performance of injurious actions. Two, repudiate the injury by acknowledging they were wrong. Yes, I take responsibility, and I was wrong. Three, express regret. I was wrong, and I, I, I regret that I did it. Four, commit in word and deed to becoming the kind of person who would not in the future inflict similar injury on others. Five, 
show that they understand that as the offenders, from the victim's point of view, the damage they have done by delivery and sex offer the victims an account of how they came to do that. It's wonderful. So that's ideal. That's what the offender does. All six of those things. And then it's up to the person doing the forgiving. Also six steps. One, for swear revenge. No vengeance will be paid. No retributive act. Now, I should add, because the relationship I'm sure you'll want to ask about is a relationship between justice and forgiveness. I should add that forgiveness, you're promising not to punish or undertake revenge yourselves, does not mean you don't cooperate with the court and with the police. Because there, the state has an interest that you've been assaulted. The state has an interest in seeing who it the person doing the assaulting is brought to justice. And there, you might fully cooperate with that. When you go to court, if you've ever been there at a criminal trial, it's not Mark Schwain versus Cooper Bender, it's the state of Minnesota versus the event. Okay, so you can fully cooperate there and see justice is done in all kinds of ways, even as you at the same time forgive, according to this model. You have to, number two, if you're doing the forgiving, reduce your own feelings of resentment. And number three, you have to commit yourself to the gradual elimination of resentment altogether. That you're going to try to rid yourself completely of resenting the person who was done eventually. Then you have to refuse to re reduce the offense to his or her actions. You have to refuse to say, they're evil people. They did something that was injurious to me, for which they apologized and showed, showed contrition. And I, as a forgiver, am not going to reduce them to that particular action. That's not the whole truth about them. Five, drop all feelings of moral superiority and recognize your common humanity. We're all sinners before God. And six, address the offender. To let him or her know that they have been forgiven. Now, you can't always do that, obviously. But ideally, there are six steps here and six steps there. So that gives you a kind of a sketch of an ideal that you can never realize. Yes, please. What was number six on the first list? On the first list, the last one was they have to give the victim a story or an account of how they came to do what they did. So that this begins to promote already some understanding. Other questions? I don't mind at all. Being, in fact, I welcome this, uh, doing what uh, they just did and raising a question. Yes? One quick um, question, um, just an observation. Sometimes uh, the person who was wrong doesn't have full recall of that issue until much later in their life. And so there's a lot of distance and time between them. And it's hard to it's hard to make up that ground. Thank you for that. Yes, that's another example of a, a circumstance that arises, which she's correctly named and is not uncommon which complicates the whole process of, of forgiveness. Um, the recollection of the injury, the assessment of just what it was, and by the way, we can rarely know without any communication exactly what was in the heart of the person who injured us, whether he or she did it by mistake or did it almost as a kind of involuntary reflex or et cetera, et cetera. We, we seldom can see uh, only God can see the human heart and hold it still. So that's well to remember. Thank you. Okay, let's shift. Okay, yeah, they saw him slow right. Five and six on the second were Okay, five and six. I should have put this on a handout and I will do that. I, know. I will do that next time. Thank you. In fact, the next time, as I make up the handouts for my wife, I will have on the reverse side the ideal 
forgiveness, six offender at the same so we don't have to worry about it. Okay. But for now, but for now, <laughs> six were. And this is on the part of the offender or the offended? offended. Yeah. The offended the person. person. Yes. The one doing the forgiveness. Yes. Never. Drop all feelings of moral superiority. Mm -hmm. So you can just put recognize shared humanity. And six is to inform the person that they've been forgiven. These don't apply to the idea of God. Right. Six would apply to God. Exactly. This applies only to transactions yeah. between groups of people or individuals that have those designs. And it's, it's clear we're going to look at. It. I don't have sure the is there a Bible in this room? <laughs> We're going to read. I'm going to read now. You provided a nice segue into this. Uh, the penitential psalm that we read on Ash Wednesday, which is gets into this issue of forgiveness and and God, Psalm 51. This will segue us into self-examination. This is a model of the first kind of self-examination, the self-examination of, of conscience. And it's for that reason, I think, that we say this psalm to begin the season of to begin the season of Lent. And you'll recognize part of it, it's woven right into our into our literature. Have mercy on me, God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom to my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy flesh and uphold me with thy free and bountiful spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. O oh God, O oh God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O oh Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise for you. Have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. For sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good design and your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and you will delight in right sacrifices in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. For God's forgiveness doesn't come about as a result of our sacrifice. Our sacrifice is enabled by God's forgiveness in this particular psalm. And it's just clear here that we seek God for God's mercy so that we can be free, wash clean our own will. So forgiveness here is definitely for the sake of the sinner. So as that model of reflection, if you turn over your sheets to look at the, at the cross, you will see examination of conscience and examination of consciousness. And let me give you an hour reading. This first one that I just read will propel you into examination of conscience if you choose to do that in the time I'm going to go up. 
examination of consciousness is quite different. And I'm going to read Psalm 139 to show you that. That's basically an overwhelming awareness of God's own seeing us, not of our own interiority being offered up to God, but of God's seeing us, loving us, gifting us, and knowing, and being the only being that knows what is really in our own hearts. And you will recognize this psalm. It's also one of the most uh, most beloved of the, of the psalms. Psalm 139. And I'm not sure I'll read the whole thing, just enough to give you a, uh, a sense of, of, of what's going on. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle on the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead, and your right hand shall hold me fast. I call this last part uh, the runaway bunny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually a, a very feminine way to, to develop a very feminine image. And uh, it's one of my favorite songs because so often we talk about sin as something legal and transgressive that has to be ransomed and redeemed rather than sin as separation and estrangement from God so that what needs to be bridged in the enormous gap in our relationship and it's God, it's God that reaches across that gap and, and grabs us rather than God paying a ransom because we owe God a lot of stuff. In other words, instead of the economic image here, it tends to often to be highly masculine in the renunciation of violence and all that. We have here a, a much more feminine picture here of this runaway bunny theology, in which our problem is estrangement and separation and isolation. And the solution is to be brought again together. We do the forgiveness is a part, but not the whole part of that process. Okay, so you can review. I encourage you to hear as part of your daily prayer, one or both of those psalms throughout Lent. But for right now, the prompts here, I want you to spend about 10 minutes in which you either do examination of conscience or examination of science. What, what was the other psalm? I got Psalm 51. 139. That's the runaway funny. <laughs> Okay, the question was, can you explain the examination of conscience and consciousness? This issue is due to the distinction, and what she means by it is examination of conscience is looking at your inward life and where you have fallen short and where you have basically transgressed. Looking honestly at your own sinfulness. Having the courage to face uh, all of those things in your heart that you rather not. Consciousness is basically opening up to a kind of God consciousness and understanding how God sees us, not how we see ourselves, and how God sees us and has mercy upon us and is gracious to us. That's what comes out of one person. Well, we can come back in 10 minutes. What is the prompt again? Sorry. I'm sorry. If you look at the back of the sheet here under self examination, you have a sheet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Which one? You pick either examination of conscience or examination of consciousness, and your reflections are prompted by and organized by one or two or three of these questions during that period. 
If I like the Thor's yeah. when everybody else is done, can I use the line that was doing? I like to say that um, it's more of like, right? But uh, so, so my message is that is it holy? I I teach you well. I uh, less you know, those ways that are deeply. Just gonna say, yeah. and they start to 
when you think what they've done. I'm going to give you about four more minutes, and uh, if some of you wish to to actually finish the process of examination of conscience or consciousness, if you notice there are some journal prompts at the end to kind of ask you to reflect on the experience of doing that, and you may enter responses in your journals to one or all of those prompts also in the four minutes remaining, and then we'll I'll let you know when four minutes are over. Okay. I'm going to 
Okay, I think I'm going to just ask you to put your pens down for a moment and try to offer some closing reflections and then a prayer. Please leave the pens on the table. I'm going to collect them and then redistribute them the next time. Uh, if you come again in the sub in in the coming weeks, it would help if you brought your own pens, and then others will have enough. I don't have enough to fly this room with you know twenty more people right now. So if you bring your own pens, that will help. Leave the pens and the extra journals. Uh, the journal that you have been working in is yours to keep. Uh, and uh, I hope that you continue to practice this discipline uh, during the season. But just to be clear, I mean, Lent is a season of, of repentance and repentance. When we beseech God for God's mercy, as in Psalm 51. And so the point of this exercise of self-examination, we really, until and unless we search our own hearts, recognizing that only God can see our hearts fully and completely. But still, unless we do that, we can't really acknowledge our sinfulness and repent of it so long. And that's very important as part of the whole process of contrition, repentance, and forgiveness, which is really central to the Lenten season. So this particular exercise that you just have gotten a taste of is there for the purposes of inviting you to continue that throughout the 40 days of Lent. Uh, and hopefully those habits will continue even, even beyond that season. So uh, thank you for your uh, attentiveness. I am going to put, this is the latest and best book on forgiveness. I, I know the literature pretty well. This just came out a couple of years ago from the guy who's the primary moral theologian at, at the Harvard Divinity School. Something called Forgiveness, an Alternative Account. And of course, all the literature he reviews. So for those of you of a scholarly bent who want to take the season to probe into the vast amount that has been written and thought by Christians, not just this one, but throughout the century, because he oh, reviews all that. Oh, and I'm going to leave it on the table here so that you can browse and look at the dates. Forgiveness and alternative accounts. And uh, any closing questions or remarks or observations? Could I could I just make a remark? Yes. So I, I love this idea of, of self-examination. And as you know, I'm an anti-war person, right? And I just want to raise up the speech by uh, President John F. Kennedy at American University um, in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the beginning of a disarmament uh, push on, on his and Khrushchev's behalf. Where he talks about international peace and how we get there, and that we must begin with self examination as a country. Self examination is what should be the precursor to any kind of violent action. Thank you. Yeah. Very welcome. And, and, and much of what has been said today that has been about individuals also applies to entire communities. And really, forgiveness is. Finally, a communal virtue as much as it is an individual one. So, thank you very much, Amy, for that for that quotation. Any other comments or remarks? So, let's yes. I'll just make a, a comment or a question or a request for additional guidance. I, I said uh, the comment about the, the forgiveness uh, and justice and how those two can exist at the same time, um, I think is a concept that I still struggle with. And um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if it needs to be answered now, but I'm just, I'm, I'm interested in further exploration of how to do justice and forgiveness um, sort of fully in the same, same manner. Thank you. Uh, this is precisely the kind of Question and comment, I welcome because now we can incorporate this in subsequent sessions and give some added attention to that very, very thorny issue. I mean, it's one thing even to begin to talk about it, but it's even harder often to live out the balance between, in a sense, love and justice. 
I mean, we face this as a parent from the first day. How do you balance a lot of your uh, in raising your children uh, and raising your families? And how do you face it among other people? Love and justice, or in this case, forgiveness. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. So let's close with prayer. God of grace, thank you for the wonderful gift of human relationships. We acknowledge that often we take our deepest relationships for granted and find ourselves at odds with each other by putting our own interests first. Help us to see the larger picture of our hurts and hopes. By your generous mercy, give us humility and courage, both to receive and to offer forgiveness, so that our life together may be restored in the unity of love. We pray in Jesus' name and spirit. Amen. So I, I'm an ADHD person who reads extremely slowly, and that has always been an issue for me in terms of trying to remain quality. So if you're like me, uh, and you learn better by having something read to you than by reading yourself, the POTS book is available on audio. Ah, thank you. I did not know that. This is the one that I put on the table, the POTS book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.